Hello, this is Andrea from our daydream back again for another awesome chat. This week we have Ann Visser. She has been equipping individuals and organizations for over 20 years to communicate in a way that aligns with their values. Ann and her husband of 42 years founded For Better Forever, and they are passionate about saving marriages. So I hope you guys enjoy. I'll see you after the chat. I think as Christians, we think we should always be okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what What is wrong with that theology that we should always be okay? That's just yeah. not, it's not the reality of life. It's not, uh, it's not being real. Uh, it's not being honest with ourselves or truthful with our father because it is the way it is. But it's also not giving him opportunity. To, it's not like where we can't like say to, to be in that desert and say, God, help me. Like, I can't do this on my own. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's happening in my life. That gives opportunity for the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us. And yeah to work out some of those rough edges in our lives, in our heart, and to actually grow and build our character. And I love that he does that for us, Andrea, that he comes in those hard times and those hard moments. It makes me not so afraid of them. Oh. Hello. Hi, Andrea. (laughs) Glad to finally be with you, huh? Yeah, it's good to finally make it. Happy New Year, by the way. I kind of wanted to know your story behind For Better Forever. Sure. Like, what brought you, you know, from where you were to now having this organization? Uh, Well, my story is really why I do what I do. Um, I um, fell uh, deeply in love with a young man at 15 and uh, crazy head over heels and I wanted to know what was different about him. And it turns out what was different about him was his faith. And, but he, all I wanted was a date. I just wanted a date. (laughs) He was thinking much further ahead. And so he said he couldn't date me because I wasn't a Christian. I was like, what's so good about you anyway? (laughs) And then he proceeded to share the gospel with me. Um, and encouraged me to start reading my Bible. And I was so lost and so broken. I was really looking for hope. And so we spent months together writing letters and phone calls, and he shared the gospel with me all along the way. And um, he encouraged me to read my Bible, and I didn't understand anything. And so I um, just in absolute frustration, one night, months later, I got down on my knees and said, God, you promised me if I would seek you, I would find you, but I can't find you. Where are you? And I had this encounter with God that was, it it was like God was saying to me, I'm here and I am yours and you are mine. And I made you for a purpose on purpose. And, and that night, um, it was like, God just met me there where I was. I raced back to my bedroom, opened my Bible and started to read. It It was like the words were jumping off the page because the Holy Spirit was just revealing, oh, that's what that means. And there was something changed and shifted in my heart. And someone said to me later, said, you know, you're going to get over this. And I said, no, I don't think so. Something has happened and changed my life. And it was Jesus Christ. Yeah. And um, we did marry about three years later. I married this young man. And um, when we got married, the photographer, the wedding photographer said, "Um, I've never seen anybody look at each other the way the two of you look at each other. So we had this madly, passionately, deeply in love. And we were both believers in Jesus Christ. And then I got pregnant one month after we were married and we had five children very quickly in six years. And then, so we had these external pressures in our marriage pressing in, but then we had this internal pressure because I, he, both of us, we didn't know how to communicate what was happening to us. He was, he's a farmer and he works long hours. And so I was left alone with these little ones Uh, and I felt like a single mom, but I didn't know how to ask for help. 
I didn't know how to talk about what I was feeling or what I really needed. And our marriage crashed. And so here we were deeply in love. And then the next thing I know, you know, we don't know what to do or, or how to do marriage or how to do love or relationship. And so we went for a date. Uh, we were sitting in our farm truck and I said to him, I can't do this anymore. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I can't do marriage like this anymore. And that started us on a path. We recommitted to each other that night. And the very next day, I went and found a book called Making Love Last Forever by Dr. Gary Smalley. We devoured the book. And as we applied it, we started to fall in love again. We we lacked so many skills, Andrea, that we needed. and But we started to find new hope. And as we did, we looked at each other and said, we can't keep this to ourselves. There have to be, there must be other couples out there who, you know, they're not toxic. There are some relationships that are toxic. Ours wasn't toxic, but I do believe if we had stayed there much longer, we could have become toxic that when we don't have the skills to do relationship really well, we get toxic because we hurt other people with the yeah. way we talk to them. Right. And so this is how For Better Forever was born. Um, we started to host marriage events. Uh, I started to work one-on-one -on -one with women. And then we went for coaches training about six years ago. I now only, I work with my daughter and she does the, the techie work. And my husband, Malis, is our financial advisor. Uh, and I have continued on with the work and the coaching and the training and that's how For Better Forever happened and was born. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful long story. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. And then, I don't know. I, I think about it too. It's like new parents, you have, you know, even one child. It's like you, especially as a mother, like you're the nurturer, like you wrap your whole world around the child and it's so easy that you could forget the aspects of like there was a love that actually designed this human being and to you know keep evolving with that and keep that alive while you're trying to raise up a child it's so easy you know, as a mother to make your whole world about this baby rather than understanding it's like, this is a family unit, you know? Absolutely. And it's a, a real challenge for us as women not to do that. Right. And just to make it all about the kids. And I remember distinctly thinking, oh, this is terrible, Andrea. <laughs> I remember distinctly thinking um, we were reading a, a book about needs and uh, we were driving into the mountains of Banff and, and we're on holiday. And so we were having this conversation about needs and he was sharing with me what his needs were. And I thought, great, I have six kids. And I thought, <laughs> man, that is terrible. Of course he has needs. You have needs too. Right. Right. And, but I had forgotten, just like you said, I had forgotten that he's a person too, and he has yeah. needs too. And, and, and it's just so easy uh, when there are all those other little needs that look like they take priority. But I say to my parents and my, my women that I work with, man, like the greatest gift that you can give your children is to love your partner, right. to love your spouse. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, like I think just about most women can relate with what you said um, is this fact like, you know, at the end of the day, your other half comes to you with, you know, their wants and you're like, but I'm like literally so exhausted right now from, you know, tending to the house, tend to the kids. And then most moms these days, you know, they have a full-time job they're working as well, plus yes. tending to a house plus tending to the kids and then at the end of the night like they're wanting like your attention it's like I just want to be left like I, I need time for myself too <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and it's such a, a challenge to balance all the needs and all the wants and yeah. and I I believe it's really important for us to know what our priorities are and so that we can know that it's okay for the laundry to sit on the floor tonight because yeah. my kids need to cuddle, you know, or it's okay for me to go out on a date tonight uh, with my husband because my kids need 
a mom and a dad that right. love each other, or it's okay for me to go for that, to, to hire that babysitter or to trade off. I used to trade off with my sister-in-law uh, babysitting. Uh, she would take my kids. I would take her kids and that would give us some space, you know, to have some time to ourselves. And so it's really important, I think, to know those priorities to, um, it's not about balancing. There's always going to be something that's kind of out of balance, but it's about being able to nurture yourself and your marriage and your kids. Right. And so I think the more we have specific habits about the way that we do that, the easier it is that it's actually happening. One thing that we do, Andrea, that really helps is um, that we have this exercise we do every night. It's what was the high point of your day? What was the low point of your day? Oh, what, do you, what do you appreciate about me today? And then what is your God moment today? And that just helps us to hear each other's voice, to know what's going on in each other's lives. So it's, it's an automatic, we do it, it doesn't take long, but it helps us to kind of stay in the know with each other about what's going on. I love that. I was just kind of awakened to recently, um, well, it's been an ongoing um, understanding since reading it in the Bible, because uh, I just started really delving into the Bible, like 2019, and um, thinking about how, you know, God designed Adam and then he designed Eve for Adam because he knew that Adam, you know, needed a help meet. And so then they ate from the tree of knowledge and then it was, it was like, um, you know, she was kind of following his lead. And so <clears throat> I feel like this isn't um, necessarily a position that the man can get into I feel like no matter where he's standing he's leading her in some sort of way so you know of course like if your husband's depressed you're going to want to make him happy you know and if you can't make him happy you're going to feel a, a little bit down about that like you know and but not only that being that the man has gained you know the world the generations to come um, he's leading over his family that, you know, he plays a big part in the whole dynamic of the home as far as, you know, his closeness with God, but also, um, I don't know, there's these men out there that will get home from work, sit down on the couch and let the woman go ahead and do the rest of the work for the evening but it's like the more the man's stepping up for that role, helping with the kids, helping with the house, you know, working together as a team, things like that. Or even like, if you're tired, go sit down. Like I have enough energy. I can do this right now. That gives the woman more availability at the end of the day to be like, I want to make you happy. Like you've done so much for me, you know, and I appreciate everything like, and it gives her that availability. Do you agree? I think it's really important to have those pivotal conversations. I call them pivotal conversations because they create a shift or a change. We weren't doing that. We weren't having those conversations because we didn't know how. I didn't know how to say, I really, I am exhausted today. I have not had a good day with the kids, even though it was written all over my face and my body language, right? <laughs> that I wasn't doing well. And, and sometimes I needed to talk about it. Sometimes I needed a hug. Sometimes I needed the dishes done, but I didn't know how to ask for that and it sounds like such a simple thing but I thought he should read my mind right like don't I look tired shouldn't you know what it is that I needed but I didn't have those pivotal conversations with him and I really think that if I can't share that with him he can't read my mind and if I put him into the position where I expect him to read my mind about what it is that I need tonight because I am tired or exhausted then I am not helping him to know me and to understand my mm -hmm. heart. And so I think it's really important for both of us. And we both needed to learn that skill of, so how do I share what I'm feeling and what I really need? And I didn't even know because I was so used, I'm a recovering people pleaser, Andrea. So I'm yeah. so used to kind of tapping it all down that I wasn't used to identifying, oh, I'm feeling grief. Today I'm feeling grief because 
I'm remembering that my mom had passed away. She loved this time of year. And it's just helpful to be able to recognize, oh, this is what's happening right now for me. And then if we want, if I want to share that with him, I can share that with him and help him understand where I am today. How would he ever guess? My mom's been gone for 15 years. Right. Absolutely. How would like, how would he ever guess that this is what's going on for me today if I don't share that with him? Yeah. Right. And so that's a skill that I was missing. And he was too, frankly. And we learned that avoiding conflict is detrimental to relationship, which is so backwards to what I thought it should be. I yeah. thought I shouldn't fight because I'm a Christian. Right. Right. Yeah. But I discovered that if I don't kind of go to the mat for what really matters and what's really important and help him know me and understand me, then he's lost. He doesn't know who I am or what it is that we need to talk about. And the same for him, too. I need to hear from him, too, about what it is that he needs and how he's feeling and what's happening in his day. And I heard somebody recently say, and this may be helpful for your listeners, too, Um, when they would come home from work uh, and they had to say a really bad day, they would say to their, their spouse, you know, I'm at about a, I'm at about an 80%. I'm topped up to an 80%. I've got 20% left for tonight. And isn't that great? Because then that, okay, we've got 20% left. What are we going to do with the rest of our night? So let's, let's get dinner on the table. Uh, Let's get the kids in their jammies and let's, I don't know, whatever needs to be done in order to make it a good night. And then their partner can say to them, you know, I've got, I've got 80% left to give. And so I'm not topped out at all. I, I'm only topped out at a 20% because I had a yeah. great day today, you know, and I, I've got all this energy left. So then you can kind of hand it off to the other partner. They can put the kids to bed or they can kind of help out. And I love that scenario. I love numbers that way yeah. that it kind of gives me a really good indication of where you are and even where I am to make me aware of, yeah, I'm, I'm running on reserve here. I've got nothing left. <laughs> right. I, uh, I I read in a book one time, and I can't remember the era, but back in back a long time ago, people were black to indicate like I'm having a bad day. Like so, like whether you be at your job or in your home, it's like I'm wearing this color. This means like I'm not really feeling my best today. So maybe you might want to watch watch how you're acting and reacting with me. <laughs> and I was like, I love that idea. I wish we'd pick that up as a society because so many times like people will smile whenever they're really going through stuff, you know, yes. just to try to shake it off. Mm-hmm. But just to let people understand, like I am kind of, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of stuff right now, you know, be mindful of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it's so easy to assume that you're the same today as you were yesterday. Yeah. And yet maybe something triggered in you today and maybe you're a little under it or maybe you're a lot under it. And Uh, maybe you, maybe this season has been really hard and you're just not sure where you are. And it can be so helpful to communicate that in some way, whether it's with a color or whether it's with that percentage about where you are and then to what you need. And I think that's a great question to ask each other. What is it you need from me now? Yeah. I love that question. Not too soon in pivotal conversations. It's important to go through that process where we call it the second C where you communicate and clarify because you want to have time. I've seen it where we rush too quick to the end and we're trying to fix it. And Mm -hmm. if we do that too quickly, then our people don't feel heard and understood. (laughs) So one of the questions that we like to ask each other when we know we're in a pivotal conversation where, you know, maybe somebody has said, maybe my husband has said something I didn't like, and I am not quite done. I've got more. (laughs) He'll say to me, is there any more? That's a great question to ask. Is there any more? before rushing to that finish line of, okay, what do you need from me? Uh, so that then we can create, that's the third C that we, we say for pivotal conversations, create a we solution. So it's not a me solution. It's not a you solution. It's a we solution. It's something that's going to work for both of us. And it really does need to be able to work for both of us most of the time in order for us to feel deeply connected and close. Right. 
I think too about um, in past relationships that failed and even in the now um, is these moments where I'm not sure what's wrong with me. I just feel withdrawn. I don't know what's like, if somebody was to ask me, you know, what's wrong? I don't know. And so like, then they tack on their own definition. And I try to let people know, like, sometimes it's just God doing something in you, you know, like, sometimes God's just working in you. And so rather than, you know, assuming that this is wrong with that person, or that that's wrong with that person, or this, or maybe it's my fault that they're acting this way, or maybe the relationships coming to an end is what ha- happened in like old relationships. It's like, oh, well, like the relationship must be ending, or maybe she's cheating on me, or, you know, all these crazy scenarios that people will come up with their, in their head because they don't actually know what's happening with that person. I'm just like, we're spiritual beings. Like God's doing things in us all the time and we're, we should be constantly moving, you know, in momentum, but sometimes it takes that wilderness period or that time of seclusion to really tap into that. And if you have a family, you have kids, you know, you have another half, you can't really afford to just disappear into the woods, you know? Mm -hmm. I love that you're bringing that up, Andrea, because that's so true. First of all, the assumptions that we can make about what's going on in the other person. And then secondly, a bad day isn't all like mostly I look at it as an opportunity. I'm going to put it in air quotes for your people who are listening to the podcast. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to know where to know what's going on in my own heart. And I remember the first time a spiritual mentor shared that with me. I was going through a really hard time and I did not like that definition of the possibility that this hard time could be an opportunity, but it really is true. And so when somebody comes for help and they're being coached and there's no triggers or there's no, there's no kind of working out, there's really no problem to work on. There's nothing to work Mm -hmm. out. And so it's really is an opportunity for any of us when we're going through a difficult time or a challenge for God to speak through that challenge. And I mean, Jesus went through the wilderness himself, right? Mm -hmm. So it's normal and it's natural to go through hard times, whether it might be grief of some type, a loss of some sort. Uh, Lots of people have lost their jobs in this season, or maybe it's the loss of a loved one, but it could be uh, the loss of a relationship the way it used to be, or there's so many different losses and reasons for our grief. And it's important to be able to recognize what's going on in me. And that's why we say the first C of pivotal conversations is to check emotions. And the re- one of the reasons why I say that's the first C is because I had such a hard time with it in the beginning. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what was going on in me. There's no way I can right. share it with another person if I don't know. Yeah. And I think one of the most challenging parts because I think as Christians, we think we should always be okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. What What is wrong with that theology that we should always be okay? That's just yeah. not, it's not the reality of life. It's not, uh, it's not being real. Uh, it's not being honest with ourselves or truthful with our father because it is the way it is. But it's also not giving him opportunity it's not Mm -hmm. like where we can't like say to to be in that desert and say, God, help me. Like, I can't do this on my own. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's happening in my life. That gives opportunity for the Holy spirit to come and speak to us and Mm -hmm. to work out some of those rough edges in our lives, in our heart and to actually grow and build our character. And I love that he does that for us, Andrea, that he comes in those hard times and those hard moments it makes me not so afraid of them. Yeah. It's okay. It's yeah. okay that it you're, it's okay. It's not nice. It's never fun to be suffering, but I just believe that God meets us and he does such very fine, beautiful work. I've seen people work through really, really hard things and come out the other side, such beautiful people, Andrea. I've seen them right. make really important, good decisions in the midst of a really hard time. And I've seen them break out into to, to do beautiful things because in the midst of the hard stuff, God has been shaping and, and teaching them lessons that are lessons that they never could have learned any other way 
to right. the depth and the degree. And then when they speak, people listen because there's so much credibility to right. what they have to say. Yeah, it's not just, it's just not a scripture that they're reading, but they can wholeheartedly say like, I've walked through this. So like, you're going to make it too. Like, you're going to make it out the other side too. Um, I, I really feel like, you know, um, relationships, like there, my daughter, she was a senior and she said she knew like one kid with their parents. So together, it's just yeah. detrimental the way that society is working out relationships and people act more so on emotion a lot of people do rather than on modesty and being mindful of other people's feelings and they're you know it really turned our society you know not having that backbone of the bible it made a society where they just act out on how they're feeling and, you know, and then worry about the consequence after it happens. Um, and so, you know, of course, with a relationship that's acting out of hate, you know, it's bound to fall apart at some point. And, you know, it's, it's really um, the Bible that showed me like what a dynamic looks like, you know, what a good, healthy, you know, dynamic looks like, because I had never seen that in my life. Like I never seen that in my home dynamic. And then I got into quite a few toxic relationships and I had never known. And I thought that there was something wrong with me whenever all along, I just had to learn what is that though? What is a healthy dynamic? I've never seen it. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And that, um, that's one of the reasons why I do what I do, Andrea. And that's why we call us for better forever, because I believe that the changes that you and I make, and I believe we all should be on that personal growth journey with Jesus Christ, where yeah. we're letting him reshape us and shape us uh, into the beautiful beings that, that he's making us to be, um, that the changes that you and I make, they, they allow our children to stand on our shoulders and that's why I call it for better forever. And then because that healing and that growth and that modeling um, just had our, our grandchildren with us this weekend and watching them copy their parents is so hilarious. And I made a mention to that, just the modeling that happens and how they see their parents argue, which is not a bad thing, but how we do it matters. Uh, how they see their parents say no to each other and accept it and, and work through those no's and the boundaries that we set with one another. How they see their parents being kind in the midst of disagreement, um, that there's there's no need to be nasty or or hurtful or cruel. There's right. great need to be kind in the midst of a disagreement or an argument, but how they see that impacts our children so much yeah. and our children's yeah. children. I believe that God's a God of generations and he's not just yeah, calling absolutely. you and I, he's calling our kids and our kids, kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you and I, we are the ones that can say for today, you know, the buck stops here, Satan, no yeah. more. My right. kids belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to stand on that and I'm going to model, uh, you know, and, and model it from my knees because I don't do it very well on some days, but model that from my knees too, that I do things wrong and, you know, be able to apologize to our kids when we do, when we don't treat our, our uh, spouse well, or, or when we don't treat our kids well, that we model that faith to our kids and that's why we call ourselves for better forever yeah I love that and I try to tell people too it's like not only that if you're in separate households you know put put your anger to the side and realize you're still modeling what a relationship looks like to your child so when they get older and they get married like do you want them to have a failed relationship like you had you know if not then it doesn't hurt for you to take your son out to pick a flower to hand to his mom, you know, at the drop off point or to still be engaged in mother and father's day and things like that, because you're still modeling that, you know, what that looks like through your child, even in separate homes. Absolutely. And I think it's so important and it's so important to respect one another and to value each other, regardless of 
of, of being in two homes or not. And I think it's really important to see the situation as maybe the problem instead of mm -hmm. the person as right. the problem. I love that. That's yeah. And so if we're in separate households and we've got more to work out, uh, we've got more to talk about in order to organize. And, and that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the person being the problem. And I have seen parents walk through that in a beautiful way and be able to manage that really, really well. And not in a sense of talk, like not in a toxic relationship, toxic situation yeah. and instead be adults for their kids. I think it's so important that adults be adults and not expect their kids to be the adults. Right. Absolutely. Do you think that a toxic relationship is worth investing your time into saving? Um, do you do you think that it's that you're able to go from a toxic relationship? I, I have this belief system in me is like, you know, the man wants to be the provider for her. So he really wants her to look up to him, you know, in order to feel like he's doing his job as a man but once the man crosses that flat threshold to like screaming at her at the top of his lungs calling her names things like that you then take that dynamic to her in a way of being in protection like now it's almost like you're my enemy instead of somebody that I can look up to do you think that that a relationship like that is able to mend and be prosperous. I'm so glad that you asked this question. And, and it's a really important question, especially for the church, because I think the church has, uh, has demanded that abused women go back to their abusive husbands without support and without care. And I think that is criminal. I think that that is um, spiritually abusive. Yeah. At the same, so I would never say to an abusive woman, you must go back. I think that's terrible. So I describe a toxic relationship at, similar to what you've said there. Like somebody is demeaning the other person. They're crushing them with their words. Yeah. They're controlling access to maybe money or friendships. I've seen that before. Or maybe they're controlling spirituality. Um, or they're misusing scripture to make it fit for them so that they can do what they want and do what they please. And that's never love. And we're always to act in love. And so no's are really important in relationship. And I remember slamming the door on our very first fight after we were married. And my husband looked up at me and he said, um, I don't think we should slam doors when we have a disagreement. <laughs> That was one of the very first lessons I needed to learn. No, that's not something we do. That's a good no. Yeah. And then I responded, I don't slam doors. Mm -hmm. And so in healthy relationships, we work with each other and we figure those no's out. And we love means I, I have made a choice and a decision to care about you, the good, the bad and the ugly, because yeah. we've all got it. Mm -hmm. But when I say no to you and no, you can't yell and scream at me and call me names. You care about that and you make an effort to change. Even if you've seen it modeled differently, you work at it to see it changed and their real change happens. You don't just promise to change because I've seen it where uh, people make promises and bring mm -hmm. presents to say I've changed, but no real change happens. The proof is in the pudding and real change needs to happen so that it does not stay in that place of toxicity. And so I think it's really, really important um, to fight for the right things in the right way um, in order to stay, in order to learn to be in healthy relationships. Um, for us, we had external pressures and we had internal pressures. We didn't have the skills we needed. I think we could have become toxic if we had have stayed in that longer because we were losing hope. And Andrea, we all need hope yeah. in our relationships. And 
the more hopeless we get, the more toxic we get because resentment builds, unforgiveness builds. And we know that God calls us to forgive. And if we stay in that resentment too long, we get toxic. Yeah. And so, but I think that all people should be valued and respected. And so even though I could disagree with you, I can still do it in a way that doesn't demean you and demoralize you. And like, I call it soul destroying. Yeah. Right. When it's destructive like that and toxic like that. And so I have very strong feelings after working with women in very toxic relationships where they've worked the, like they've done the process to work, walk out of it because you don't know how a toxic person will, a to some people will respond to love. They will respond to love and they will work at changing their behavior and their actions and their attitudes. Some toxic people will not respond and change, yeah. but you have to do the process in order to kind of figure it out, but you should never be in physical danger. You should never be right. in soul sucking danger for a long period of time because it will create trauma in your body and it will make you sick. It really does. In fact, yeah. It, it makes you feel like you're going crazy. And I've heard my women describe it that way. I feel like I'm going crazy when really the crazy is the way they're being treated. Yeah. Um, it's just not right. It's not love. And it's just so painful. Right. Um, I think back on, you know, my childhood and my relationship with my stepfather. And I feel like that kind of, you know, put this, um, sense inside of me that took away my youth that made me, you know, what God was calling for me to do was to heal. So then, but instead of healing, I just looked for a man to make me feel better, you mm -hmm. know? And so I think it's really important that we, you know, if, if somebody is single, that they really look into like, what, what all, traumas do I need to heal from before you even start looking for somebody because I really do believe that each toxic relationship that I was getting into what it was doing was it was calling me to heal myself so that I'd stop putting myself into situations where I would be attracting to me people that needed to be healed like they had they were toxic um, I was toxic. And so it's that healing process that really makes you look at people in a different way to where you might actually find somebody that's not like all the toxic people that you've ever dated in your whole life. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it's really important to bring 100% of myself to relationship. And so I believe that everyone should be on that personal growth journey that you talked about to deal with traumas, to deal with past hurts, past pains, past grief, uh, all of that, that we all need to be on that personal growth journey so that I can bring and you can bring 100% of yourself to the relationship and and for single people oh it's such an opportunity to be in healthy relationship with peers either at work or in your church or in your small groups and to deal with and to work through those challenges and those issues there you know anytime i'm feeling triggered i know it's time to race to to papa and to sit with him and to journal through some questions to let him heal to let, help me understand what was the trigger what was happening here what am I feeling what am I thinking what is it that I need uh, and allow papa to heal those hurt places inside of me those traumatic places that have been uh, hurt so that when I get into that situation again I can kind of get in front of that trigger and anticipate I may be triggered here but then take those thoughts captive like the bible talks about to not let myself run down that trauma road that path that old path and let God make those new paths in our brain that heal that. yeah and let the word of God just work out some new neural 
neural trap pathways in our brains so that we can respond instead of react to those triggers. And it, I've seen women do it. It's so exciting to see women heal and uh, they become powerful in the midst of life and the work that they do. Yeah. For better forever. That's uh, life coaching. Um, you coach relationships, right? I primarily coach, I primarily work with women. Actually, I've recognized that women, when we work on ourselves, it makes a difference for the, their relationships. And if they're married to good, kind people, their good, kind people respond because the women change the steps of the dance of relationship. And that mm. creates, the, the other person is kind of stumbling along unless they come along and, and learn those new skills as well. And so it really does help when one person works on a relationship. We're not talking here about toxic, toxic. Uh, when one person works on relationship and learns new skills, the other person kind of picks up on those new skills. I was like, wait a minute, I like this better. <laughs> yeah. I like this conversation better. Let's do more of this. And so I primarily work with women one-on-one. -on -one. I have a membership for Christian women called the Sisterhood Journey Membership. We meet on Tuesday nights and uh, it's three nights a month. And we do, we're right now we're talking about pivotal conversations. We're launching into what does listening look like? It's so powerful. You know, the Bible talks about us, uh, you know, be quick, be slow to become angry, but be quick to listen. And so yeah. we're working on that listening skill, putting it to practical, uh, practical work. Each woman works on a different skill or a different goal, I should say, while we're working on the same skill toward the goal that they're working on. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what their growth goals are and what they've um, that what they're working toward. Um, we've had amazing women that have given their testimonies about the change and the transformation that has happened for them in the sisterhood journey. We have two levels. So we have the goal. The diamond level membership is open twice a year and it includes the group coaching on Tuesday nights. And then we have the gold membership, which is all evergreen. So each week we put up some new content there on the sisterhood journey, gold level membership, but women can go there at their own pace. It's a uh, more affordable as well for those who are concerned about pricing. Right. I love that. I actually um, learned about communication and listening skills through a life coaching certification. And I really did think that I was excellent in these areas until I started learning about it. I'm like, I'm really, I really suck at listening and communication. Like, and if, if whenever I thought about it, I thought about, you know, most human beings, they learn from their parents that never really gain these skills. And then you know, and then they're really not taught it, you know, in grade school and stuff. So a lot of people don't even know the, it's so important to learn listening and communication because it's so easy for us to pick out of conversations what we want to hear. Absolutely. It, and it's a transferable skill, which is what's really exciting to me. So I see our women taking the skills and not only putting them into their personal relationships, but then taking it into their workplace relationships too. And I have some great women uh, and they're taking it into impact uh, their coworkers. It's impacting children, teachers who, who are working with children. And that's just so exciting to me, Andrew, because for better forever, really the definition is that we impact the next generation. And yeah. so I'm just so very excited about the way that each woman is using the content in ways that I hadn't even expected, but the impact yeah. is far and wide. So that's really exciting to me. And then it comes back and teaches you some new things that you would never thought about. So that's incredible. Yeah. I also have a program that I run um, frequently. It's called How to Avoid Falling for a Jerk. And <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love the course. It's been written by Dr. John Van Epp, and I just ran it virtually for the first time. I've been teaching it for 10 years. I've been teaching it in a local jail and at a home for recovery um, it, from addictions, but I've also taught it to youth and young people and singles and singles again. And so I love this program because it's based on attachment theory. 
And I have learned so much. I've been married for 42 years, but it's really impacted me in the way that I do relationships because I'm recognizing uh, how I'm getting attached to people that aren't healthy or what I need to do to kind of slow it down. So it's an incredible program. It's five weeks. Uh, it's a five week course and it's a, it's a one hour for five weeks, but it is just amazing in the application of, of how can we be in healthy relationships? What does that even look like? And what does unhealthy look like? Because we all mess up some of the time, but what does healthy, unhealthy really look like? Yeah. I think I think a big issue with me and society at large is like, do you actually even know what you want? Or are you just gravitating towards the first person that, you know, winks their eye at you? Like, do you really know what, what it is that you want? Like, how can anybody satisfy you if you never really thought about what do I want and what do I need? Two, the two questions, Andrea, what do I want and what do I not want? Right. Right. So I, I remember as fi- a 15 year old deciding that addictions was not going to be a part of my relationship, uh, of my marriage. And so I remember distinctly breaking up with a boy uh, who who was drinking and driving. And because I didn't want to be a part of that. And so that wasn't even going to be a conversation because that was a decision I had made at 15. That's something I did not want as a part of my life. And for me, that part of that definition was, okay, if you're drinking and driving, this is not, I'm not doing this. Right. <laughs> so what do you want and what do you not want? So we go into all of those things within that course of how do you avoid falling for a jerk? I love it. It's so exciting. Right. Um, how, did the, how did we find you then? Yeah, sure. So you can find me. Actually, I have a free resource for your people. Can I pass that out? Pass that along? Yeah. So yeah, we've been talking about pivotal conversations. And if your people have been putting off a pivotal conversation that they really want to have, but they're not sure how to get started, I have what's called a seven day challenge to help you get ready for your next pivotal conversation. So each day I send out a short video with a simple action step to help you prepare for step by step for that next pivotal conversation that you want to have. You can go to uh, For Better Forever. That's the numerical number for For Better Forever dot com forward slash challenge to pick up that seven day challenge and you can get started right away. And that really is a great way to stay in touch with me because there you can sign up for our uh, weekly newsletter. It's called the Tuesday Brew with Ann because I love my coffee. <laughs> yeah. And this is where I share weekly communication tips that will help you align with communicate in a way that aligns with your values. And I just love that. I want believers to be communicating in a way that really aligns with their values, their faith values, their values to to want to love their people, but just not sure how to do that. I help you to communicate in a way that aligns with your values. That's amazing. I'm also going to be posting links out and stuff like that. So yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I'm glad that we finally got together. Thank you so much. A great big thank you, Andrea. It's great to meet you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here on your podcast. And I wish you all the best in your podcast. Look forward to our next conversation. (laughs) Awesome. Blessings. Thank you, Andrea. Bye. If you like this podcast, please hit subscribe because we have an awesome guest coming every week and I don't want you to miss out. God bless. See you next time. Bye. Thank you.